In this video, I'm going to explain what the definite integral is. Now, in order to do that, I need to show you what sigma notation is, if you don't already know it, and how it is used to write the area under a curve. Sigma notation, or summation notation, is used to write lengthy sums in a compact form. So the Greek letter sigma, which is, looks like a fancy E, um, is used, and it stands for the sum. So if you look at um, the way that it's written here, the sigma notation has underneath it an i equals m. The i stands for the index of summation variable, and the m is a lower limit of summation. And this is where the sum begins. Above the sigma notation, up here, is the n, and that's the upper limit of summation. And this is where the sum will end. So what happens is that each integer from the lower limit, in this case m, to the upper limit, which is n, including those numbers, is substituted in turn for each occurrence of i into the term f of i. And then after that, the results are added, hence it is the sum. So remember that you're using integers to substitute in for each uh, variable i. Now you may use any variable for the summation variable, but most often you will see the letters i through n to be used. The lower and upper limits may be any integers, as long as the upper limit is greater than or equal to the lower limit. The term in the sum may be any function of the summation variable. And the summation variable may also be used as a subscript or superscript as well, as you will see later on. So just to kind of help you understand how the sigma notation works, I have a simple example here. So we have the sum from i equals 0 to 4 um, of the function 3i. So how this works is that we're going to plug in the number 0 in for i. So we have 3 times 0. And then we're going to add the next term. So we increase to the next integer, which is 1. So 1 is now plugged in for i. So now we have 3 times 1. The next integer is 2. So we have 3 times 2, and then 3 times 3, and then 3 times 4. And we stop here because the upper limit is 4. Then we add up all of these terms together, and we get 30 as our sum. So note, um, kind of an important little t note, is that the number of terms in this sum is equal to n minus m plus 1. So notice that if I take 4 minus 0, I will get 4, and then I need to add 1 to get 5. So in this case, if you check, there are 5 terms in the sequence. Now, a Riemann sum, um, you learned about, oh, sorry, to go on, um, a Riemann sum. Uh, you learned to approximate the area under a curve using rectangles in the previous section. So for example, let's consider the function um, f of x, which is graphed below. So like before, we're going to divide the interval from a to b into n subintervals of length delta x1, delta x2, and so on, where the ith subintervals has length delta xi. So I'm just going to quickly um, divide this up. and so on. And so we'll divide up the whole um, graph into rectangles. All right, so I divided this graph into um, some rectangles, and we're gonna say that, let's say that this rectangle here, and I tried to divide it up using a midpoint approximation. Let's say that this is the xi, so the height of this rectangle is f of x i, i being the ith rectangle, and then this distance here, the width of the rectangle is delta x. So each subinterval, we've created a vertical rectangle uh, that touched the curve, and these rectangles can lie either above or below, as you notice. Now each rectangle has an area of f of xi, which is the height, and delta xi, which is the width. So this area can be positive, negative, or zero. Depending on um, the location of the rectangle, whether it's above the x-axis or below. Finally, what we 
what, finally what we're going to do is to take the sum of all of these products. So we're going to use our shortened notation. We're going to use the sigma. And we're going to say that the first rectangle is i equals 1. And we want to go all the way to the nth rectangle. So we're going to take the x i -th rectangle. And the height will be f of x i. So that will be the height. And then we're going to times that by delta x i, which is the width of the rectangle. So as long as f is a continuous function on a closed interval from a to b, and all the lengths of the subintervals tend to zero, then a Riemann sum will converge to a common value. All right, so let's define this a little bit more. So this leads us to the definite integral. I know it's a little bit confusing, um, but I can hopefully I can try to explain it a little bit clearer here. So the more rectangles we take, uh, the better the approximation is. So if I can draw more and more rectangles, of course I will get a better um, estimate of the area. So this will give us, um, or we will need to use the limit um, as n goes to infinity because we want to take more and more rectangles. So we can say that the area is equal to the limit of these sums, okay? And what I'm trying to show you is that n is going to infinity, it means that n is getting bigger and bigger. We're drawing more and more rectangles, but we're always multiplying f of xi, which is the height of the rectangle, times delta x, which is our width. So this gives us, if I expanded this notation, the limit as n goes to infinity. So the first rectangle would be f of xi star, and I'll explain what the star is in a little bit, times delta x plus f of x2 star times delta x. Now what I'm doing is I'm assuming also that delta x, the width of each rectangle is the same to make it easier. Plus dot 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 plus f of x n star, which is the last rectangle, also with a width, so times delta x. So this expression is called the limit of a sum, or it's actually called the Riemann sum. And it is so important that it's given a special name and notation. And that's what leads us into the integral. So by formal definition, I know it's a little bit wordy, um, but if f is a function defined for a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b, which means that there's a function between a and b, we're going to divide the interval into n subintervals of equal width which we'll call delta x. And you can see that's b minus a divided by n, like before. We're going to let x naught equal to a, which is the first number, and then x1 all the way to xn. xn will be our last number, which is going to be represented by the letter b. These are going to be the endpoints of these subintervals. And then we're going to let x1 star, x2 star, all the way xn star be any sample points in these subintervals. So what that means is that the star so let's say x1 star, this lies in the ith sum interval, where it is x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. So that means that we're picking a point in this rectangle that will represent um, the place, I guess you can call it, where we're going to find the height of that rectangle. Then the definite integral of f of x from a to b is denoted as follows. And this is what it looks like. Now, I know this definition is very complicated, but you don't really need to know exactly what this definition is, but you do need to understand what this symbol here is. So this means that we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx, which actually stands for the limit, which I described above. Now, this limit has to exist, and it has to give the same value for all possible choices of sample points within that interval or within that little rectangle. If it does exist, we say that f is integrable on a to b. So to define what all of these little parts mean, this is called the integrand. And the dx, that is important because it identifies the independent variable, tells us what the variable is that we are integrating with. So just like we had dy dx, notice remember it was dy dx, 
the x was the independent variable. So here we have the dx over here, which means that's the variable, the independent variable. We have our integral sign. And the a on the bottom is called the lower limit of integration. And the upper value, the b on top of the integral, that is called the upper limit of integration. So the definite integral, it represents the sum or area with continuous unbroken sampling of x values from a to b. It is as if we were summing all the products of the form f of x times d of x as x goes from a to b. So what we're doing is we're adding up all of these little rectangles, but what we're going to do is actually now use the symbol, um, the integral of, um, actually here, so it's read as the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Or you can say the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x. So the definite integral can be interpreted as a net area. That is a difference of areas. All right. So just as a very simplified geometric example, suppose we have the following function. And the area under the curve would be this part here. So it's always between the curve and the x-axis. But we can also have the area below the x-axis up to the curve. So any area above the x-axis but below the curve is counted as positive. And any area below the x-axis and above the curve is counted as negative. So let's say that we have these shaded areas. We're going to call this a1, a2, and a3. Then we're going to say that the integral or the area of this would be a1 minus a2 because it's negative and then plus a3 because that's positive. So to end off here, um, the, there is a theorem to describe the existence of definite integrals. And we know that all continuous functions that are integrable, or sorry, they are integrable, that is, if a function f is continuous on an interval from a to b, then its definite integral over a to b also exists. Now I know this has been a very, uh, more of a there's no examples and I, it's been very um, wordy but I'm going to show you in the next video um, how to look at some examples geometrically.